again, the Shoreline family. It's me, Jermaine Harrison, with our final message of this summer series we've been calling High School Heroes. Thank you for following along. I pray that you have learned a ton um, from the teenagers in the Bible with a heroic faith that led them to a heroic life. And last but not least, we're going to look at a very obscure um, teenage girl in the book of 2 Kings, kind of halfway through your Old Testament. But I promise and I know that it will be an encouragement and a challenge to you as you live your life. And so I want to start by sharing with you a story from my high school experience that is uh, etched in my brain. Um, I think maybe I was a freshman or sophomore in high school, and at the high school that I went to in the Caribbean, uh, during lunchtime, uh, we would all go to the, the gym, the basketball gym, and watch uh, the basketball team play basketball, kind of hang with friends, different things like that, and the way you got into one of the five-on-five five games was as soon as the... the you know, the prior game was over, you ran onto the court and you took one of the five positions. And so you had to be ready in a spur of a moment. And uh, I remember one time, you know, the game ended and I wanted to play the next game. And so I sprinted onto the court and I assumed one of the positions. And then uh, one of my uh, classmates, his name is Charles Samuel. He came to the very same spot where I was at and he refused to move. It was as if he was pretending he didn't even see me. And so he stood in that spot and acted like, you know, he was there first when he really wasn't. And so we were both kind of annoyed at each other, kind of started, you know, jabbing at each other, you know, to, to take that position. And then we started pushing each other and it escalated quickly. And friends of both of ours came, ran onto the court and held us back. And we, there wasn't a fight, but it was close to it. And in that moment, I just remember feeling so mistreated that I was there first, but he came in to try to take my place. I felt so unnoticed in that he was trying to act like I wasn't even there. And, and I would venture to, to guess that every single one of you guys, every single one of us watching or listening have had some sort of experience where you've been mistreated, maybe by uh, someone else, or you've, you've been uh, unnoticed or attention wasn't paid to you it was as if you weren't there and that's a really tough uh, feeling to experience but the reality is that we've all experienced it and all probably will again at some point in the future and the story we're gonna look at today helps us the story from God's Word this teenage girl will help us see how to respond to being mistreated and how to respond to being to going unnoticed and so if you have your Bible, turn with me to the book of 2 Kings chapter 5. It's in the Old Testament, kind of halfway through all the pages, 2 Kings chapter 5. Let me give you a quick context. That this story takes place during the time of the kings in the nation of Israel. And so remember, the nation of Israel was, uh, there were slaves in Egypt. They were freed by God. They went through um, the wilderness for 40 years. And then they took over the promised land that God had, had promised to them. And then they lived through a time where they were led by judges. Um, and then eventually they asked for a king just like all the other nations and then you know we had such famous kings as David and Solomon and Saul and eventually the kingdom split into two and then for several centuries uh, the nation of Israel was led by kings some who followed God and some who didn't and this story that we're gonna read kind of takes place during that time so before they're exiled for their rebellion against God while they were being led by these kings and so specifically at this point in time there was um, unrest between Israel and one of its uh, neighbors the nation of Syria that you've probably heard of and, and so because of this this uh, constant conflict, the Syrian army would sometimes go into Israel and perform raids, you know, steal property, um, take people captive, take them hostage back to Syria. And one of the times that they uh, conducted one of these raids, they found uh, this little girl, this teenage girl, and they took her away from her whole homeland, took her away from her family, from everything she had ever known. And 
brought her back to the land of Syria. And she became the, the slave girl of the, the captain of the army of Syria. And his name is Naaman. And this teenage Israelite girl was his wife's servant. And so that's where we find this story. So this girl has been ripped out of her normal life, taken from her family, made to live a different life than the one she chose. And yet we'll see how she faithfully responds to her enemies, to being mistreated, and to being someone that's virtually unknown. And I think there's something for you and I to learn here. So in 2 Kings chapter 5, I'll read verses 1 to 3, just to kind of give you a kind of a the context as we go ahead. 2 Kings 5, 1 through 3. Um, it says this, The king of Aram, or Syria, had great admiration for Naaman, the commander of his army, because through him the Lord had given Aram great victories. But though Naaman was a mighty warrior, he suffered from leprosy. Leprosy is a skin disease, boils on the skin, that could ultimately lead to, um, to death. And so this captain of the army, Naaman, was seriously sick. Verse 2, At this time, the Aramean raiders of the Syrian army had invaded the land of Israel, and among their captives was a young girl who had been given to Naaman's wife as her maid. Verse 3, And one day the girl said to her mistress, I wish that my master Naaman would go see the prophet of God in Samaria, that is in Israel, and he would heal him of his leprosy. And so I want, I want you to go there with me. She's in a foreign land with a foreign people forced to live a life she doesn't want to live. She's being mistreated in every sense of the word, right? And yet her response to being mistreated isn't to mistreat in return, isn't to be marked by anger and frustration and outrage, but instead, she seeks the welfare of her enemies. That is a countercultural thing that we learn from this young woman. Romans 12, 17 um, also illustrates what she's doing here. It says this, Never pay back evil with more evil. Do things in such a way that everyone can see that you are honorable. And so while this young teenage girl was being mistreated, she chose to treat others the way God would want them to be treated. And so here's the, the, you know, the sub-principle that we learn from her life. Don't treat others how they treat you. Treat others how God calls you to treat them. Now, I'm not talking about situations of, of abuse verbally or physically or whatever it might be. In those situations, if you're in that situation, you should seek help. You should seek justice. Um, you should seek care. But I'm talking about the everyday, normal occurrences of life where people mistreat you through their words, through their attitudes, through their um, actions against you. And this young woman teaches us that we shouldn't treat others how they treat us because in our brokenness and sinfulness, we are prone to mistreat one another, but rather to treat others how God calls us to treat them. What an incredible lesson for you to learn, for me to learn. Let's keep going with the story, reading verses 4 and 5 in 2 Kings chapter 5. It says this, So Naaman heard this great advice from this young woman and told the king what the young girl from Israel had said. And then the king responded, go visit the prophet. I will send a letter of introduction to you for you to take to the king of Israel. So I don't want you to glide over that or gloss over that too quickly. This captain of this huge army of this uh, significant nation listened to this um, teenage girl that was ripped away from her family and her regular life, but was still looking out for the best interests of her enemies. That's crazy. And even more crazy is that she gives him advice and he takes that advice. Somehow, this teenage girl had gained the trust of Naaman and his wife. And they believed that she had their best interests at heart. She, you know, as some would say, she had a trustworthy reputation, right? And so the question for you, the question for me is, man, do I live a life that leads others to trust me? Do you live a life that leads others to trust you? 
You see, trust is built over time with a series of small decisions. Doing what you say you're going to do, telling the truth, rejecting lies, rejecting slander and gossip, and being a person marked by um, truth, righteousness, justice. Man, she was a person of integrity and it led to um, her being trusted by these people with great power. And so the, this, the sub principle once again here for you and I is this, work hard to be a trustworthy person. It is a worthwhile investment. This girl in an unideal situation sought the best interest of those who were not seeking her own best interest. And they listened to her because she had gained their trust with tiny decisions over the course of time. How are you doing at building trust with your friends, with your family, with uh, classmates, with neighbors, whoever it might be? You have an opportunity to work hard to be a trustworthy person. And to wrap it all up, just as quickly as this teenage girl comes on the scene, she fades into obscurity. Right? She comes on the scene, she's taken from her home, she uh, tells Naaman and his wife about this prophet of God that could rescue him, that could help him um, experience healing. Right, And then we never hear from her again. There's no more story about her. They don't, we don't hear or read a recording of uh, what Naaman says to her in response. She fades into obscurity. But the amazing thing is, she leaves a lasting impression. She leaves a lasting impression. Let me read verses 15 through 17 of 2 Kings 5, and then we'll wrap up, all right? So here's her lasting impression. Naaman goes to Israel. He goes to this prophet. He asks his prophet to help him. The prophet encourages him to dip himself seven times in the Jordan River. And after the seventh time, Naaman is cured. His skin, his skin is smooth. He no longer has leprosy. And he goes back to this prophet of God that he had heard about from this teenage girl. Look at what he says in verse 15. Then Naaman and his entire party went back to find the man of God. They stood before him and Naaman said, Now I know that there's no God in all the world except in Israel. So please accept this gift from your servant. And Elisha refuses in verse 16, but notice verse 17. Then Naaman said, All right, but please allow me to load two of my mules with earth from this place. And I'll take it back home with me, you know, as a, to, to be a, a, a memory, I guess. And from now on, notice this, I will never again offer burnt offerings or sacrifices to any other God except the Lord. Do you see this? this? This teenage girl in an unideal situation where she was being mistreated chose to be a person of integrity that led to her being trustworthy. Uh, gave hope to this Syrian captain. He goes to this prophet of God, uh, is healed, and ultimately becomes a follower of God. That's crazy to think that this one little act of faithfulness by this teenage girl, whose name we don't even know, results in this Syrian captain knowing and trusting in God. And so here's the, the principle I want to leave you with. You don't need notoriety to leave a lasting impression. You don't need to be famous. You don't need to be well known. You don't need to be well respected. You don't need to be noticed by a ton of people. All you need to do is trust God, offer the hope of God that you have experienced to others and trust him with the rest. That's what this little teenage girl did and it led to this man coming into a relationship with God. What do you think your text message could do? What do you think your phone call or FaceTime could do? What do you think your Instagram or Snapchat or whatever social media post could do if you are intent on sharing the love and hope of God that you have experienced? If you believe that Jesus loved you so much that he came, lived, died, and rose again from the grave to offer life to everyone on this earth, man, you have an incredible privilege to be on mission for him. 
You don't need to be famous. You don't need notoriety to leave a lasting impression. And I pray that in this upcoming school year, that that truth would mark you. Love y'all. Have a great week of worship. We'll see you guys soon.